Cheryl Harris, uh, who is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the UCLA Law School. Uh, Cheryl is, I guess, internationally known as a theorist and activist on questions of racial oppression. She's author of the acclaimed article, Whiteness as Property, in the Harvard Law Review, 1993. Thanks so much, Rich. Thank you, Robert. And can y'all hear me? Yeah, more or less? OK. Um, one of the other things that I am pleased to say that I am here at UCLA is Interim Chair of African American Studies. And um, I want to thank um, um, my folks here from the department because um, this has been a signal year. Um, I took on this position in July of 2014, and I'm actually going to start by taking myself back to what was happening in July 2014. Um, last fall, at a panel at the law school entitled From Gaza to Fer Ferguson, I started my remarks as follows. Days after the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson on August 11th, a 25-year-old mentally ill black man by the name of Ezell Ford was killed by the Los Angeles Police Department in South Los Angeles as he walked near his house. The police claimed that as they stopped their car and attempted to speak to him, he kept walking and, quote, made suspicious movements, including attempting to conceal his hands. When they moved towards him, he tackled one of them, they said, and they reached, and reached for their gun and they simply exercised self-defense in shooting him, including some shots which entered his back. Neighbors in the area had a very different account. They reported that when they saw the police approach him, they explained to the police that he was known in the neighborhood uh, as somebody who had uh, mental illness, and they said that this was also well known to the police who normally uh, police the area. At least one witness directly contradicted the officer's account that Izell had assaulted the police before they fired and subsequent to this, the medical examiner has said that he was shot in the back of the head. Days after the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, police shot and killed another victim, also well known in the community for having mental health issues, after he was accused by the local storekeeper of stealing a couple of bottles of soda. The videotape shows the man walking towards the police car with his hands at his side when they opened fire. On September 9th, the Huffington Post reported 13 killings by the police of black and Latino men and, and, men and women. And the Malcolm X grassroots movement reported on extrajudicial killings, contending that a black person is murdered by the police, vigilantes like George Zimmerman, or security guards, once every 28 hours. That's where I started in the fall of 2014. That was the beginning of what I had to say. Since last fall, the pattern that I was attempting to identify and mark has only become more visible and acute. Increasingly, the tissue of lies that has propped up these assaults, the alleged violent nature of the victims. You recall that Darren Wilson claimed the demonic face of Michael Brown was what caused him to be lethally dangerous, even though he had no weapon. All of these lies were exposed through the tape and the shooting of Walter Scott by the police in North Charleston, South Carolina. While the lived experience of black people and people of color has repeatedly affirmed that the claim that violence is necessary and legitimate, it took that grainy video taken by a startled yet conscious bystander to validate the truth of what people have already known. While Walter Scott was gunned down in cold blood, his killer was confident that the casual impunity which has historically cloaked and excused these actions would work again, not simply to exonerate him, but to praise him, to applaud him for doing his job and defending himself. That Michael Slager could be so brazen, even against the backdrop of all this pro protest, all this national work, all the things that Justin has just talked about, national media attention, speaks volumes to the level of protection that he believed he could rely upon. Think about this. There, the, the, uh, the, everything was under a microscope, and yet that man felt he could shoot him in cold blood and get away with it. He, like the police in Baltimore, has been indicted, and that itself is a monumental hurdle. Uh, we could compare that to the failure to charge Darren Wilson in Ferguson, even as the Department of Justice documented the efficient operation of a racialized citation and collection system that extracted revenue from black people for state operations that both ignored them in terms of delivering services and targeted them. But we all know from the Trayvon Martin killing that indictments do not equal accountability. And part of the problem is that the quotidian nature of the experience has heretofore been normalized, legitimated, 
even if there are some of us who valiantly and persistently protest against it. So what are we to make of this, of this situation? Well, one of the things I want to take apart, because at some level I really feel like Justin has pretty much laid, set the table for everything we need to talk about. But I, I do want to actually go after what I think are some of the predominant narratives that are circulating in response to some of the protests. And I'm sure all of you have maybe heard it in, in terms of engaging people that are in your circles. Um, but I, I think in terms of just trying to push back against it, it's important to think about. So one of the dominant narratives now is that this is a result of individual decisions and mistakes. Um, and this is really a popular narrative, particularly among the political class that Justin has identified, uh, and not exclusively uh, or entirely, but in particular. And I want to argue that it reflects a presumption against race as a salient social structure in determining outcomes. And there's such a strong investment in this colorblind narrative that naming a pattern as a pattern is itself vigorously resisted, sometimes even by the people who are victimized by it. Uh, and, and this is, I think, really um, a painful but powerful point. That is to say, to acknowledge um, that it is a pattern of state-sanctioned violence um, would be to repudiate the dominant racial framework of colorblindness, and that is a framework that people of color some of us have even bought into. Um, and what I mean by framework is to refer to what lies between our facts and our perceptions. That is, the structure that allows us to make sense of the world. This is what we mean when we say, these facts make sense, as well as when we try to make sense of the facts. That's what I mean by framework. So I'm talking about colorblindness as a racial frame, as a conceptual structure that operates at both the macro or big societal level, as well as the micro sort of individual cognitive level. That is the way in which we just process information. And it's this pre-existing frame under which racial disadvantage is understood to be a product of something other than racism, right? Um, and um, because of, you know, the notions of biological inferiority have largely been repudiated, although it's a scary thing if you sit down and talk among some of your colleagues how salient that still remains. But that's a whole nother, that's another conversation. Um, but primarily because, at least in certain ways, notions of biological racial inferiority have been taken off the table. We are understood now in the contemporary context that racial inequality is a product of cultural dysfunction. That is, the issue is not blood, bad blood, but behavior. So we're black people to engage in normatively appropriate conduct, were we to work hard, attend school, avoid drugs, resist crime, save money, not riot, we would transcend our current social status. And under color blindness then, black people are not inherently or biologically inferior, but culturally deficient and insufficiently assimilated. And one implication of this claim is that black disadvantage is a product of culture. Um, and racial inequality will disappear when black people get fixed. This notion of cultural dysfunction is still quite prevalent, even in terms of the interventions that have been contemplated, and that's what I want to turn to here. The narrative seems to be that the riots are the product of people who have been rendered dysfunctional in some sense, and that the answer lies in addressing or fixing that dysfunction. Uh, even before the riots, initiatives like My Brother's Keeper, for example, that the President has rolled out, acknowledge that there is a crisis, but instantiates that crisis in exclusionary gendered terms, as though there's a whole half of the community that doesn't matter. And it also relies upon notions of racial uplift and a politics of respectability that still positions black people as problematic and needing some kind of fixing. Um, another part of this myth um, is that this pattern of individual actions is, um, in fact, amenable to intervention by better training by the police. Um, that is, the idea is you look at uh, some of the murders here, um, the, the response seems to be, and, and, and a lot of this is quite well-meaning response. I'm not meaning by this to indict people as sort of being venal or, you know, so it's, 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 it's actually much more pernicious because it is well-meaning. Um, that while training may make the individuals more aware and smarter, it eludes or elides that fundamental change that Justin was talking about. Um, so training about teaching the police how to handle mentally disabled people, addressing uh, cognitive bias, all of these are important, but they cannot substitute for the long-term questions because what we see is that the targets shift. Uh, racial hegemony has the capacity to update itself 
and uh, change. So in other words, uh, think about, for example, the conversation about body cams. So part of the argument here is that um, the visibility of these deaths and these murders suggests that, one, the, the body cams themselves are the mechanism by which we can hold, hold people accountable. If we can just see it, right? Of course, we've been seeing it, right? We've been seeing it a long time, and it's been recorded a long time. And, I, you know, based here in Los Angeles, we can go back to the beating of Rodney King, in which was one of the first moments where we saw a sort of visible um, abuse of a black body by the police, there was no accountability. And the question is, what is the gap between that visibility and accountability? The notion that somehow simply making it visible is accountability is problematic. And what we know historically is that not, is that not the case. The second thing is, what do we think body cams will also do? What are some of the risks that are entailed? And please don't take these remarks as to say, I don't want them to be body cams. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to say that there are problems. There are contradictions here. One is, uh, I want to argue that it will normalize a certain kind of panoptic surveillance. Uh, I mean, the notion that somehow, uh, if we subject ourselves happily, willingly, yes, let the police sort of um, uh, record their interactions with me, somehow that's going to buy me safety. There is a trade-off here. Um, the second thing is it will itself further legitimate the racial project of policing. That is, it does nothing to change the underlying structural problems that Justin was uh, just talking about. It further, I think, risk uh, projecting visual images of black and brown bodies as further evidence of criminality. Y'all have seen cops, <laughs> right? Has that done anything, right, in terms of disrupting the association between blackness and criminality? If anything, it has done, it has just simply reinforced it, okay? The third thing is sort of a technical thing, but hey, I'm a lawyer, I, you know, I get off on this. So the question, <laughs> so the thing is, um, there are a set of rules about when do the police get to review the tapes, okay? So there are, there's actually legislation being proposed in the state of California, I haven't tracked it uh, recently, but I think it was on the table as of a week ago, that would allow the police to review the tapes before they write the reports. Okay. I don't need to say any more about that. Okay. So what is my point here? My point here is that we can't get lost in this. We can't get lost in terms of our overall project. The, prob the problem that we're facing is structural, as, as um, Justin mentioned, but I actually want to um, pick up on a, a point that he made and, and push it a little further, which is that the violence committed within black communities by the police, as well as by black people on other black people, which of course gets brought up in this conversation as well, cannot be isolated from the violence that is perpetuated and sanctioned by the state which devalues black life and ultimately subjects all to premature death, either by bullet, by neglect, or by disease. And all of the toxic conditions under which too many black children have lived have predictable and documented consequences in terms of the normalization of violence. Um, some of you may have followed Jesse Williams' brilliant Twitter rant. Did you all see it? Um, if not, look it up. It was ab absolutely brilliant, in which he basically challenged the selective condemnation of violence as a racial project. That is, he was saying the ways in which people are calling out this violence is itself a racial project, which is ignoring the violence that is meted out on a day-to-day -day level against black people and other people of color while excusing white violence. As Richard Rothstein of the Economic Policy Institute has written, what we are witnessing from Ferguson to Baltimore is, quote, the fruits of government-sponsored segregation. What I would add is that this segregation is a form of psychic, economic, and social violence. As Rothstein pointed out, Baltimore's innovations, Baltimore has been very innovative, um, um, of, in the structures of segregation date back to 1910, when it adopted the policy of restricting blacks to live only on certain blocks. They went that far. The mayor's explanation at the time reads like a slightly more frank version of the contemporary policies of state planning and development. At the time, he said blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disobedience, to prevent the spread of communicable disease into nearby white neighborhoods, and to protect property values among the white majority. Right? 
there's not a huge amount of distance between that articulation and the articulation of some of the policies and politics and the justifications. Uh, this policy of containment is still operative, and so too are the patterns of structural de deprivation. I don't know if some of you saw this, but Baltimore, like Detroit, is shutting off the water to residential families, okay? Um, so as people subjected to these conditions, the political narrative either says that we are lawless and rightly contained by lethal force, it's legitimate, as Robert Cover says, to use the violence of the law to discipline not only the individual transgressor, but to authorize the use of greater state power of surveillance, intrusion, and regulation. Um, and ultimately, um, as people subjected to those conditions, even when those conditions are deplored, the status quo is ultimately justified by appeals to order and the rule of law. And the utter failure of these mechanisms to curtail or mitigate these conditions never becomes visible in the broader public discourse unless there is an eruption. The massive use of force is authorized not only on outlaws, but on the ordinary. And it's that indiscriminate use that we're talking about today. The logic of colorblindness itself that suggests that race plays no role unless the shooter signs an affidavit to that effect sets the stage for the con continuation of racialized violence as it sustains deniability, however implausible. I want to close uh, just by returning to the point that Justin uh, made in terms of the um, understanding of how to situate this violence. One of the things that we've seen is that how many cities now Right, and we've only been a year out, right? While these racial conditions are often described as specific and local, they are part of a broader global context. And just as slavery was a globalized system, so too is the racial logic of white supremacy. And this is what William Patterson and the Civil Rights Congress understood in 1951 when they filed a petition to the United Nations charging the United States with genocide against the Negro people. The petition specified the evidence supported in the claim, including the long list of racial murders uh, for which there had been absolute impunity. This petition was not heard or decided. The authors of that petition, including Robeson and others, were denounced as communist and crazy. Um, but it also produced a contradiction, or I should say heightened a contradiction within the movement itself, the civil rights movement, because some of, uh, as those people were demonized, others distanced themselves. Um, and so it was deemed to be a too radical internationalist fringe. Um, the point I'm trying to say about this story is why did segregation become visible in 1950, 40s, 50s? Do we really know? It certainly wasn't that nobody noticed before. And it was certainly not that people were not protesting before. Um, and it was certainly not that something magical happened. But I do think that it's worth thinking about why are these police killings become visible in relationship to why did segregation become visible at a particular moment. It's not about the tape or the video. What I want to argue is that it's about it becoming important and visible to ourselves. And one of the things that I think we are witnessing through the kind of work that Justin's and others are doing is, is it's not necessarily to say that we are not interested in sort of stitching together and pulling together a coalitional effort that actually addresses this question. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that at, at heart, what this is really about is about us believing in our own humanity and making it visible to ourselves. Thank you.